Welcome to worship today and thanks for inviting us into your home. I'm Kip Rose and one of the pastors here at Asbury and thanks for entering the wilderness with us. Today is the second Sunday in Lent. Lent is the season of 40 days, not counting Sundays, from Ash Wednesday until Easter. It's meant to be a time of sacrifice and self-reflection, recalling the 40 days Jesus spent in the wilderness. One pastor referred to Lent as the long walk with Jesus to Jerusalem. Last Sunday, Pastor Matt reminded us that John the Baptist, preparing the way for Jesus, started in the wilderness. Jesus' long walk to Jerusalem started in the wilderness. Emily Heath writes, Who wants to go into the wilderness? I'm not talking about camping and hiking. I'm talking about real wilderness here, where we wrestle with ourselves and our spirit and our relationship with God. What good is it? You can't put it on a resume. It doesn't earn you any money. It doesn't really make your life easier. It might even make it harder. So why would you do it? You see, the wilderness is a dangerous place. You don't volunteer to enter the wilderness, but, but sometimes the wilderness finds us. We don't seek out pain, loss, violence, pandemics, racial strife, or division. Sometimes those things find us. Sometimes wilderness happens, uninvited and unwelcome. Life doesn't always go according to our plan, what we think should happen. Like one guy said, my parents had big plans for us kids. Complete eighth grade and stay out of prison. Well, they might have been able to accomplish that plan, but life doesn't always go according to plans. We can all relate to this. You might say, I thought I would be married by now, or I thought I could retire by now, or I thought the kids would have been moved out of the house by now, or I thought my career would have taken off by now, or I thought we would have had children by now, or I, or I thought my dreams would have come true by now, or I didn't think I'd lose my job. I didn't think I'd get cancer. I didn't think I'd ever get a divorce. I didn't think we'd have problems making our mortgage. That wasn't part of the plan. You see it throughout the Bible. Noah didn't plan to build an ark. Abraham didn't plan to be the father of a new nation. David didn't wake up as a teenager and plan one day to be the king. Esther didn't plan on being used by God to stop a genocide of her people. Mary didn't plan on getting pregnant outside of marriage. Peter never planned on leaving behind his fishing nets, and Paul never could have planned that one day he was going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations. It wasn't in their plans. But our plans are sometimes disrupted. Wilderness happens. Times of isolation, times of testing, times of temptation, times of, of soul searching. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna look at some wilderness episodes from the Bible, and I hope it will serve as reminders that even though the wilderness can approach any time, there is always a guide to lead us back. And even these deserted places can be a haven of the holy. God can redeem even the most difficult and painful times in our lives. Well, today we head into the wilderness with Jesus. Mark's Gospel tells the story in, in two simple verses. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. That's from chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel. Jesus wrestles with what it means to be faithful. He's tempted by Satan, evil personified in the wilderness 40 days. At the end of it, Jesus emerges, but it doesn't really get any easier. The greatest challenges are still to come. Do you, do you remember what happened immediately before this incident of Jesus in the wilderness in the tempta facing temptations? It's the story of Jesus being baptized. He emerges from the water and he's visited by the Holy Spirit and a, a voice from heaven proclaims, You're my son, the beloved. With you I'm well pleased. John the Baptist has prepared the way for Jesus. He's baptized him in the Jordan River. You might say this is Jesus' anointing and commissioning for his public ministry. It is a, a, a moment of profound affirmation for Christ, a moment of spiritual and mental strength. 
He's not been accosted by the Pharisees, not been questioned by the Sadducees, not been thought to be crazy by his own family or chased out of his hometown synagogue. At this moment, Jesus is nothing but blessed and affirmed in his future, in his identity, in his strength. He is the beloved Son of God. Doesn't that sound like the perfect script for a fantastic life and ministry? comes out of the baptismal waters, the heavens are torn open, a voice from heaven declares, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Wouldn't you think that experience would propel Jesus into his mission and ministry? But instead, that same spirit that was present at his baptism drives Jesus into the wilderness. That's how Mark's gospel describes it. Jesus is forced into the wilderness, driven, the same word used when the Bible says Jesus drove out the demons is used here. It's forceful into the wilderness. Matthew and Luke's gospel share more details about what happened. Here's what Matthew says. When Jesus was led up by the Spirit, notice how Matthew's gospel softens the language that's found in Mark. It doesn't say driven, it says led up by the Spirit. Led up by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil it says, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, and, and note here that the tempter is quoting scripture. It is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. That's from Matthew chapter 4. The first 11 verses. When are you most vulnerable to temptation? Is it when you're at your weakest? Or is it when you're at your strength, your strongest? Or is it when you're at your strongest weakness? When, when are you most vulnerable? It might be when you're feeling at a low point, when you're feeling weak. But it also could be at those moments of your greatest strength, your greatest triumph, your greatest success, when you're riding high in the saddle and there's applause everywhere around you. At both moments, our highs and our lows, we're vulnerable to temptation. Jesus faces temptation in the wilderness at a high point in his life. And he's tempted in the wilderness at a low point in his life as he's starving, he's famished. Pastor and author Fred Craddock says that what makes temptation so, well, so tempting is that a real temptation is an offer not to fall, but to rise to greater heights. What is offered seems good, attractive. Craddock writes, the tempter in Eden didn't ask, do you wish to be as the devil? But do you wish to be as God? And he concludes saying, no self-respecting devil would approach a person with offers of personal, domestic, or social ruin. That is in the small print at the bottom of the temptation. Well, in our story, Jesus faces three temptations. They're real temptations for him. First, to turn stones into bread, magically taking care of his own hunger. He says he was famished and, and potentially using that power to accomplish much good. The second temptation is to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple whereby he'll prove to his tempter and to all the people there how special he is and how special he is to God. The third temptation is to have all the kingdoms of the world given into his hands 
That is to have enormous political power if, and here's the catch, if he will just sell his soul. One commentator says these three temptations boil down to uh, seeking nourishment apart from God, testing God for the sake of self-indulgence, and abandoning God for the sake of acquiring fame, fortune, and power. Another commentator says these temptations are even trickier, more deceptively appealing than that. He says they can be summarized as, take care of yourself, prove your faith, and save the world no matter the cost. Well, however you understand them, some form of those temptations plays itself out in each of our lives. But today, I really want to focus on and point to what the tempter, what the tempter is really testing Jesus for. I don't think that Jesus is being tested for his ability to, to work miracles. I, I don't think Jesus is being tested to see if he'll play to the crowd. The key to understanding the devilish intent of these temptations is found when the tempter says, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God. The one who comes to tempt and test Jesus is, is not testing Jesus' ability to perform miracles. The Diablos is testing Jesus' attitude as the one announced to be the beloved Son of God. He's testing his attitude. How could the beloved Son of God not affirm his beloved status by turning stones to bread so that God's beloved could be fed? How could the beloved Son of God not fling himself off the temple pinnacle with complete confidence that God would safely deliver the beloved Son for his future mission? Yet Jesus holds on to the spirit of Israel's faith, if not Israel's follow through, by recalling God's previous commandments to the people that pointed to faith and trust, not showmanship. Jesus knew the Torah, he knew God's law, he knew by heart the mistakes that kept Israel stumbling in the wilderness for 40 years. Remember how the Hebrew people had complained about the physical conditions? It was hard for Israel to remember that God delivered them from captivity in Egypt when their bellies were growling with hunger. Yet even the miracle of manna became bland after many months. And instead of praising God for the food, Israel resented the monotonous diet. Israel's wilderness experience also seemed to inform another one of Jesus' response to the devil's temptation. Physical safety was a high priority for the Israelites wandering the vast, barren desert. All the big miracles God had provided, getting them out of Egypt, destroying the Egyptian army, pursuing them, those wouldn't mean anything if the next generation couldn't be provided for, if they weren't protected. So Israel in the wilderness was continually uneasy. Over and over they asked God for something safer, something better. At one point, unrest over what seemed like a lack of water led the people to revolt. God, through Moses, miraculously provided the people fresh water from a rock. God always gave Israel what they needed to survive, but Israel didn't always seem to trust that God understood what they needed while they were in the wilderness. Well, Jesus refuses to echo Israel's doubts and despairs. Jesus refused to let the tempter play either on his physical weakness, his hunger and his exhaustion, or his spiritual strength, his affirmation as God's beloved son. Jesus simply remained confident, obedient, and humble in the face of life's realities and also God's power. Confident, obedient, humble. In the face of these temptations, Jesus is claiming his identity as the beloved Son of God, claiming that, and he's also clarifying that. What does that identify? identity mean for his mission and ministry as the beloved Son of God. Leonard Sweet, a pastor, professor, and author, shared this illustration of the power of the temptations Jesus faced. Do you remember how Staples, the office supply store, had a series of commercials a few years ago featuring the easy button? 
in their ad whenever a person confronted a difficult situation, all they had to do was reach over and push a red oversized button that read easy. You remember the easy button? That was easy. That was easy. You got to pick up three kids, make dinner, finish the report at work and be supportive to your spouse. No problem. Just press the easy button. That was easy. Do you need to do a risky surgery you've never done before? Hey, just push the easy button. That was easy. Are you faced with the need to balance economic growth and stability with environmental safety and the welfare of a worldwide ecosystem? No problem. That was easy. It's easy, right? Big problem. There are no easy buttons. There are no easy buttons to free us from the trials and tests of the tempter. Remember, Jesus taught us to pray not save us from temptation, but lead us not into temptation. Temptations are real. Temptations are all around. And Leonard Sweet concludes saying, Jesus' experience in the wilderness with the tester gives us all a snapshot of our own lives. How many times a month, a week, a day are each of us tested in some trivial or profound way? The cashier hands us back too much change. A coworker is too friendly, too close, too suggestive. Getting ahead means getting around some laws, getting through some loopholes. Jesus' response to the devil was not to push some easy button, but he did push a reject and reset button. When confronted with the final test, Jesus refused even to dialogue with the devil. His response was complete rejection, no negotiation, only negation. Away with you, Satan. But this dismissal was followed by a powerful positive. Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The reject button followed by a reset. Rededicate your life to prayer and praise, faithfulness to God. In the wilderness times and times of our greatest need, we seek our strength from beyond ourselves. Our strength comes from God. A boy and his father were walking along a road when they came across a large stone. And the boy said to his father, do you think if I use all my strength, I can move this rock? His father answered, well, if you use all your strength, I'm sure you can do it. The boy began to push the rock, exerting himself as much as he could. He pushed and he pushed and the rock, the rock did not move. Discouraged, he said to his father, you were wrong. I can't do it. The father placed his arm around the boy's shoulder and said, no, son, you didn't use all your strength. You didn't ask me to help. There is no easy button. Wilderness time is when we need all our strength. And God is our strength. Again, in the words of Jesus, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. That's a reset button. We rededicate our life to prayer and praise. We put our faith and trust in God and we accept our identity as a beloved child of God. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for being our strength in times of trial and testing. We thank you for offering your forgiveness, your love, and your grace. Empower us to claim our identity as one of your beloved children and give us the gift of a faith that is greater than temptations. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Oh,